So good afternoon and thank you very much for, for coming. And I kind of feel like there's a, an extra thank you I should say. When I found out that this session was going to... Oh, should switch to the PowerPoint as well. When I found out that this session was going to be the last one of the conference and we're not in some out-of-town convention centre with no bars and no exit apart from the coaches waiting to take you back to the hotels, but we're in a casino with possibly the most kind of distractions anywhere and the room is full of people. You have, I think you have stronger resolve than I do, but uh, I'm here to present, so... Um, I will make sure we get through this as quickly as possible so that you can get to the tables, the bars, or your hotel rooms, or what you want to do after this. So I hope you found the conference fun so far. You're still here, so that's obviously a good sign. So I'm Paul Duffy. I'm here with um, Umesh Sampat and Peter Mark Verwood. We're all solutions architects in the New York-based um, solution architect team, and solutions architects help customers like you who are thinking of deploying applications into the AWS cloud and make sure that you understand all the building blocks that we offer and you can do it in a way that takes the best advantage of all of the AWS Cloud's capabilities. So you guys can sit down now. They're going to come back in a, in a, on the stages too, uh, too small for the three of us. So this session, it's got what we... Ooh, crazy clicker. So we thought it was an interesting session title. You're all here, so it seems that some of you are either curious or you also think it's interesting. But what does this actually mean? Well, what we're going to try and do, many of the customers that we speak to are often faced with tasks of how do they've got an idea for an application, they've got an application that they want to move into the cloud, and for all of those various application components, they've got a bunch of architectural decisions to make. What are the best ways to do this thing in the cloud, particularly in, in this context in the AWS cloud? So we're not going to kind of do some kind of complex debugging kind of thing here, but what we are going to do is take an application that we've built and dissect it at the level of going through all of the tiers of the application and the kinds of architectural choices that we've made and how we've ended up where we have in the way that it's deployed in AWS. So first of all, we're going to cover the kind of thing that we're building, the things that we care about, which is kind of leading into the architectural tenets that we've chosen and that we'll revisit as we go through the presentation. We'll demo it to show that it's real. At this point, my erstwhile colleagues will go through and, and talk about the architectural choices that we've made at each um, tier of the application. Then we'll have another demo, hopefully, to, to kind of inject some excitement at the end of it, and then we will finish off. So what are we building? Well, we're building an application for people to share things that they like, and we're calling it likability. We hope it's going to be very popular, and the kind of italicized very there is really around the title that when we're talking about how to build this, we're making the assumption that we want to select an architecture, we want to select the right set of AWS building blocks in the right way so that we can scale from 10 to 10,000 to millions and millions of users. We're not trying to have some architecture that we start with that we're going to have to change later. We also know mobile users are absolutely first-class citizens these days, so the mobile component of that is very important. But the key thing is, we're talking about how we're making the right choices to make it internet scale. So what do we care about? Our users, we want to be able to reach them, whatever kind of device they're doing. We want them to be happy with performance. We want, you know, if we suddenly have a surge because we're mentioned in TechCrunch with our, our mythical startup, we want to be able to cope with that seamlessly without us having to worry about all this undifferentiated heavy lifting, which is one of the key parts of the AWS cloud value proposition. We want it to delight users, and we also want it to be secure. So the kind of tenets that we've got for the architecture that we define for this, we want to be able to get to internet scale and to get to internet scale easily. We do not want to have to keep changing things or refactoring our architecture as we go on. We need the thing to be highly available. This is for consumers. Consumers that can be fickle and if the thing's not reliable, they're not going to want to use it. We want it to perform well and give a good experience for our users and to be secure. As we go through this presentation, we're going to revisit these tenets in the context of each of the decisions that we make. So what does likability do? Well, it's not all that complicated of an application, but then again, there are some very successful applications on the internet that are not all that complicated. It lets users add photos of the kind of things that they like and share them. It lets them do that from the web or from a mobile device, and it lets their friends like and, and express their interest in the things that they have. So one very important thing before we continue, because there's a whole... How many people consider themselves in architect roles in this room? So quite a few people. So one of the things that we want to make very clear, 
This is one way to do this. This is not the only way that you could possibly do this, and we don't want to get into some kind of big argument about this is the only way to do it. This is one way, and the architecture team in the context of Peter, Mark, and Umesh have made these decisions, and they'll talk you through why they've made those decisions, and at the end, you can go to the bar with them, and you can argue about why they made those decisions. But it is one way. It's not the only way. We're not focusing on whether we could only have built this with the stack that we've chosen using Linux, for example. Could we have built it with the Microsoft stack? Yes, we could have done. But that's not the focus of this session. So we just wanted to clarify that up front. So let's do a quick demo of the application. It's going to be a fairly, fairly simple demo because the application is fairly, fairly simple. So I shall just get my demo laptop ready. And switch to it here. So who in the room has heard of or is participating in Movember? Anybody? Some people in this room are going to be featured in a way that they didn't expect. So as you can see, and you know, a little bit of self-deprecation, I'm not participating in, in Movember. And that's for one reason, that you kind of learn the things that you're good at. And I went to Australia for a month between jobs a while ago and stayed with a friend and determined that Movember was not for me. <laughs> Very much not for me. But there are other people for whom... Movember is absolutely right. Umesh, one of our colleagues here. So here is likability. We've got the picture of Umesh with his moustache. Six views, five people like it. So he's got a pretty good ratio there. And we can add a little heart. So you should find that uh, six people like it now. And um, the AWS team in New York and um, Virginia, we've raised about $4,000 for, for Movember. Would you trust some of these people? Here's a nice one. If anyone was at the party last night, they might have seen the glasses. And they might have seen this person who's in the room now. So if you're next to, if you're next to Derek, you can uh, compliment him on his skills. But it's basically a very, very simple application. Lots and lots of photos that we're going to potentially have there. Here is the gallery, which kind of is frightening me as I look at it now. Um, so let's, for, for light relief, show one of the capabilities from the, the web version of the application. We're going to share something. So we're going to upload one of these files here. And it's R. It's a, it's a lovely golden retriever with a moustache. Happens to be Umesh's dog. So, very, very simple application, really. Lots of photos, and now Umesh and Peace Mark in a moment are going to talk a little bit about what, how they've made certain architect architectural decisions there. So switch back to the presentation. Here is the kind of the canonical architecture. We've got front-end web servers. We've got a database tier. We've got an application tier. I'm not going to focus on talking about them now, but we are now going to dissect this application, and we're going to go through each of the tiers, from the data tier to the web tier, the application tier, then talk about some of the specific things that we've done for mobile and how certain things that AWS offers make it easier um, for us to interact directly with those services. Uh, and we're going to start off with the data tier. And Peter Mark here is our, our data architect, so he's going to walk you through why we've made those kind of decisions. So I shall hand over to him. Thank you very much, Paul. So the data tier. The data tier to us was absolutely critical to get right for our, you know, for our application to be successful. Why is that? Well, you saw in the demo that Paul gave just a few moments ago there's not a lot to our application other than asking users to give us pictures, to give us information, and save that, and be able to return that to them. We're asking users to give us their content. And if we can't properly store that content, if we can't reliably store that content, and be able to serve that back reliably to users, then our application has no value. If you can't take a picture of somebody you know, with a funny mustache and say, send the link out to your friends, hey, click this 10,000 times because it's hilarious and then they go to the link and the picture's not there or the link doesn't work or they can't reliably say, yeah, I love this, it's too funny, then, then our application has no value, it does nothing. So we have to get our data right because otherwise our application doesn't do anything. So I mentioned this briefly, this is the kind of data we're talking about. We're talking about pictures, user-generated pictures, and the, and the metadata around those pictures, describing those pictures. And so, Going back to what Paul was talking about, we're, we're not really trying to plan for day one of the launch or even day 10. We're talking about 
an application architecture that will handle millions and millions of users. We want to be ready for that so that we don't have to change things midstream. We want to be ready to handle millions of users uploading hundreds of pictures themselves and doing hundreds of millions of pictures in our application architecture. So what are these going to look like? We're going to have lots and lots of these little pictures. I mean, pictures are generally, in a relative sense, are not large file sizes, maybe a couple K, a couple megs. Outliers will be fine. But for the most part, they're small images, small files, and then all this information about them. And then we're going to have a one-to-one -one correspondence of images, of images to information about them. And then when we want to present them, we're going to say either get me one image or get me a bunch. It's not a whole lot of complexity there when we try to get this information. So really, we, need to take two, we needed to make two architectural decisions. One, where are we going to host these images? Two, where are we going to host the information about these images? So let's look at the first one, the images. Like I said, millions and millions of images, not really big. But we need to store them reliably. We need to be able to give them back to the users when they ask for it. So we chose to use Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3. If you're not familiar with S3, it is a service designed to be a highly available, highly durable object store. Now, what does that mean? Highly available means that it is a regional service within Amazon. It's spread across multiple data availability zones. And data that is written to S3 is spread across those availability zones. It doesn't write at just one spot. It writes it in multiple spots. And it doesn't even write, confirm that you've written successfully until your data has been written to multiple locations. If you saw Werner's keynote this morning, Alyssa Henry, the head of storage, spoke about S3's redundancy and how it's built in. And in fact, S3 is built to withstand the loss of an entire availability zone and still be able to serve the content and the, and the objects to users without interruption. So we know that it's highly available. And then highly durable, again, those, it's not just one copy of your information. It's multiple copies of that information. Finally, it's meant, it's, it's an object storage, which means it's not using block storage like a, uh, like a disk system. It's not taking, uh, taking individual portions of an object and, and, and chopping it up and putting it on a disk. It's storing an incomplete file that you give it, a complete object that you give it, so that it can return that many, many times. We're not talking about updating something frequently. We're taking images from users. They're going to give it to us once, and then we're going to return it a bunch of times. So this architecture is actually designed exactly for what we want to use it for. So we chose Simple Storage Services as our first architectural decision. Let's go back to those tenants that Paul described. You know, does that fit what we said we would set out to do? So does it scale? Absolutely. If you watched um, Andy Jassy's keynote yesterday, you saw that S3 is now uh, hosting over 1.3 billion trillion. I'm sorry, 1.3 trillion objects. So it's an incredible scale. So we're not going to start there right away, but we're going to get there. Or we want to get to maybe not trillions, but we want to get to millions and millions of objects. And S3 is already well and above that. So we know it can scale to what we need. Is it highly available? Absolutely. It's spread across all those availability zones. It's built to withstand the loss of availability zones. It's absolutely highly available, so we know that we can serve those images those that the users are giving to us and serve them back. Is the performance? Absolutely. Again, from Angie Jassy's keynote, over 800,000 peak requests per second. So that's great performance. That's performance way beyond what we're going to need when we start out. We know we've got space to grow. We know that the growth can happen with S3. Is it secure? Absolutely. S3 will secure. We can use HTTPS so we can be secure and encrypted in transit. We can use server-side encryption on S3 so that our data can be secure at rest. So we feel very good about it taking care of our security and hitting all four of these tenants. So does it fit the tenants we specified? Absolutely. We feel really confident about storing images there. So the next part that I said we need to store was the metadata. And this is where we're talking about the information associated with the images. So who uploaded it? When did it happen? How many people have seen it? Who's liked it? What is it? And a title about it, a tag about it. And finally, some sort of unique identifier that the system will generate in order to retrieve that information later on. So all this metadata about the picture or something or other, we, we decided to come up with an internal vernacular, an internal definition for our own purposes. We call that a likable. So we have likables and we have pictures. So a likable is really a very simple data structure. It's the unique identifier along with the information about it. It's not much more to it. 
The likables don't really need to talk to each other. There's no really relationship between the, uh, the likables. When we, when we perform queries on the likables, either we're getting a single or we're getting a, an entire list of them. And we know that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between likables and images. So it's a pretty simple data structure. So when talking about storage, we, we want to talk about what kind of database storage we're going to use for this item, for these items. Now, we, kind of we sat down, we looked at it, what options were available to us, and it kind of comes down to two camps in a very broad sense, so relational versus non-relational databases. So if you're not familiar, relational databases are built for, as the name implies, building relationships between bits of information. So for example, an e-commerce site might have a user's table and an order's table. User's table has information, first name, last name, address, um, you know, credit cards, and so on. An order table will have things like what was in the order, when was it ordered, and who ordered it. And so we build that relationship by connecting who ordered the, to uh, the, the, who made the order with the user table. And so you can build on that and make more complex queries and find out more information about the data you're storing. And so relational databases are built for this to offer you that flexibility and that versatility and that complexity of relationships between data. And so part of the, that's part of the advantage, part of the downside that comes along with that is that it makes it more difficult to scale those databases up. It's not impossible, but there reaches a certain point where you can't get a server that's any bigger. And you've got to think about scaling out. You've got to multiply your databases. And there are strategies around doing that. Again, not impossible, but becomes much more difficult to be able to scale out these databases. Non-relational databases were essentially, in a broad sense, come up, they, they, they were come up with, it, or they were defined, let's say, uh, to solve that problem, to be able to scale up easily, to be able to scale up just at the push of a button or adding another node, adding more resources, something that lets you scale easily, and be able to scale up to a large, large amount, a lot more than a relational database. But again, on the flip side, you kind of lose some of the advantage that you gain from a relational database you lose the ability to have qu complex queries and relationships. So that's where the name kind of comes from, non-relational databases versus relational databases. Now, we took a look at our data, and we, again, it was a very simple data structure. We know that our queries are not going to be complex. We don't really have relationships. So we decided that we're going to use a non-relational database or a NoSQL database. Now, when we made that decision, it was, it was a very broad decision. We knew that it's not simply a matter of saying NoSQL and then that's it. There's going to be however many equivalent NoSQL databases out there because it's not the case. NoSQL databases are not generally equivalent. They are very different. They have different strengths, different weaknesses, and they don't, there's not one skill set that says, well, you've learned one, you've learned them all. So we had to decide which NoSQL database was right for us. Which one did we want to use? Which one was appropriate for us to use? And so we thought to ourselves, well, what do we want to be experts at? What are we experts at? And we thought, well, we want to be experts at our application. We want to be experts at likability. We want to know how that works, the ins and outs of that. And we want to spend our time and engineering effort on making likability awesome. What we're not interested in being experts at is becoming database administrators and figuring out how to install a NoSQL database and figuring out how to administer it properly and allocate more resources and find out what resources are appropriate and when to add more and so on. We didn't want to do that. That's not something that we want to become experts at. We want to make sure that what we are experts at is where we can offer differentiation, where we can make our application better. And so what we chose to use was Amazon DynamoDB. So if you're not familiar with DynamoDB, it is a fully managed NoSQL database. And what do I mean by fully managed? Fully managed means that it is not a database server that I can install somewhere. It's not a database server that I have to deal with administering. It's not something that I have to worry about partitioning and growing and adding more resources. It is a database service where all I say is I want a table, I want to have this level of performance, and I want to start using it right now, and that's what it's going to offer me. So that really fit our use case really well. We didn't have to worry about becoming database, DynamoDB administrators. We don't have to administer a DynamoDB cluster and add more resources as we grow. DynamoDB is built to handle that scale and that growth without any intervention on our own. We don't have to pre-provision the storage. We can put as much data as we want on a DynamoDB table. It would just grow as we add it without any intervention. We can set the provision throughput on a DynamoDB table so that we can start at a reasonable level that meets our performance or meets our needs and grow with that. 
So if we need 100 reads and writes per second today, that's fine. If we need 1,000 reads and writes per second tomorrow, that's fine. Day after, 10,000. Day after that, 100,000 reads and writes per second. We can do that with DynamoDB. We can set it to whatever we want, whatever we need, and it's taken care of for us by the DynamoDB service. So it is concerned with dealing with adding more resources, adding more capabilities, being able to meet that performance uh, throughput that we're requesting. We're not the ones dealing with that. The service is taking away all that administrative, undifferentiated heavy lifting off of our hands and taking care of it for us so that we can just use the database as we need it and not have to worry about that. And really, we can focus on our application and not focus on becoming database experts or database administrator experts. So decision number three is we are going to use DynamoDB for, to store our metadata. So going back once again to the, our, uh, to the tenants, does this scale? Absolutely. We know that it can scale to whatever throughput that we need. We know that the storage will scale to whatever we need. So we'll absolutely be able to scale and grow with us as we grow, hopefully again, to millions and millions of users. It can grow with us. Is it available? Yes, it is. Like S3, it is spread across multiple availability zones. When you write to DynamoDB, it's not just written in one spot. It's written to multiple spots. And it doesn't even successfully, it doesn't acknowledge that you successfully wrote it until it's been written to multiple spots. Can it perform? Absolutely. The data storage is on SSDs, which means that the reads and writes are really, really fast. They're under 10 milliseconds to get a read and write. And again, we can set that provision throughput so we can get any level of reads and writes that we need, that we want. And so we know it's definitely going to perform. And again, security. HTTPS, we can secure our content in transit, and we can encrypt our data so when it's in DynamoDB, it's secure at rest. So we feel really confident that that data is secure and it meets all these tenants. So does it satisfy everything? Yes, it does. So what we did, we, we looked at the kind of information that we had, the data that users were giving us, so we could be secure and, and confident that we can reliably store that information and be able to return it to users in a timely fashion, in a reasonable fashion. And we did that with using S3 and DynamoDB, sharing those principles of availability, durability, and security. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Umesh. Let's talk about the web tier. Hi, folks. So as Peter Mark mentioned, thanks, Peter Mark. Um, I'm going to talk about the web tier, and we'll basically try and, quote, unquote, dissect the web tier, if you will. So essentially, as, as Paul mentioned, um, we were actually building this application. And when we started thinking about our application, we were thinking in terms of, well, how many users uh, really we might actually have at launch? We might have a few hundred users, a few thousand users, and what have you. However, we, we needed to architect our system in such a way that we could manage and handle the scale without having to re-architect as new, newer users came online. Ideally, we'd like to have millions of users as quickly as possible. But given, uh, given the fact that uh, we, we, we could essentially have a small set of users to begin with, we needed to ensure that our architecture was, was ready to go in terms of um, scalability and performance. So let's actually talk about what do we really mean when we say uh, web tier. Pretty straight, straightforward. Uh, Paul demonstrated when you, when you start talking about our web application, we have a whole bunch of uh, static content that we're, we're uh, delivering to users. We have some dynamic content, as well as we want the user experience uh, for our users in terms of the upload abilities of our application uh, to be fairly seamless and, and fairly straightforward. So that's the context that, that we'd like to set when we discuss what we really mean by, uh, by a web tier. So there were several design decisions that we needed to make uh, to, to essentially as we started looking at our web tier. So some of the decisions are, what kind of operating system and web stack should we choose? What should we do in terms of, of load balancing abilities as well as scalabilities of, of our web tier? How, how are we going to handle DNS uh, for us? We, we basically need to ensure as our application grows in scale, we have a reliable DNS solution and a highly scalable DNS solution that can actually manage and, and uh, meet our, our, our scalability needs as, as our application grows and the, and the number of users um, that are actually accessing our application grows. In addition to that, we, we basically were thinking in terms of 
uh, users and, and the user experience. So what can we do? Should we really think in terms of, of having a content delivery network front uh, some of the images, some of the user content that was being generated so that uh, folks can actually get better performance uh, from our application? So these were some of the decisions that we're actually going to walk through. So first is operating system and web stack. This kind of goes back to what Paul mentioned. I mean, in, in our case here, this really was a choice for us in terms of what were we comfortable with, right? So in, in our case, we, we, we felt Amazon Linux is something that we're comfortable with. Apache and Ruby would be just fine to meet our needs for our web tier. So that's essentially what we chose. However, you know, folks could have easily chosen, or we could have easily chosen Microsoft technologies, uh, perhaps uh, .NET, IIS uh, being, being the, the web server, or we could have essentially chosen maybe a Java stack, if you will. Uh, so from an OS versus web stack perspective, for us here, really, it was uh, about what were we truly, truly comfortable with. And so the decision that we made was we were essentially going to use uh, Amazon Linux for our operating system, and we were going to essentially use uh, Apache and, uh, and Ruby for our, our web stack. So this part right here was very, very critical for us. When we started thinking about load balancing and scaling, this is really where some of our, we had deep uh, conversations around what or how should we actually structure our web tier such that it can handle the scale. The key aspect of our web tier was we didn't really want to over provision uh, capacity to, to handle our peaks. And quite honestly, we had no idea in terms of when we would peak or what that peak would look like. Ideally, we were anticipating millions and millions of users as quickly as possible. So when we started thinking about load balancing and scaling, there were two things uh, that, that came to mind. One was, A, we needed a distributed load balancing solution that could handle the load balancing needs across multiple web, uh, multiple web instances, if you will. The other aspect uh, of, of the load balancing piece was, well, can the load balancer itself scale with our, our, as a demand group? So, that, so in terms of scalability, just within the load balancing context, we had those two questions that we had to address. Uh, from, from an act, actual web stack perspective, that was the other thing that we needed to be concerned about. Should I provision 10 nodes? Should I provision 100 nodes? Should I provision 1,000 nodes? Uh, and, and I actually don't really know how many nodes do I need. So we needed, uh, we were thinking in terms of how can we actually implement the, the elasticity principles uh, that the cloud, uh, cloud provides us, and specifically AWS services provide us. So from a decisioning perspective, we actually looked at the, our elastic load balancing solution. So Amazon's elastic load balancing solution does two things for us. One, it can actually distribute uh, load across multiple web instances, pretty straightforward. Uh, but more importantly, it can actually scale, and it, it essentially would scale out as, uh, as, as our, our customer demand grew up. So we really didn't have to think in terms of, well, when our customer demand really goes up and we have many, many users coming to our site, do we really need to re-architect uh, our solution at the load balancing tier? And so with, with ELVs, we didn't need to do that because elastic load balances gave us that ability to scale. In terms of the actual web nodes themselves, we again needed to implement elasticity principles, which were, well, we need to essentially add more nodes. As, as Andy mentioned uh, in his keynote, perhaps, perhaps you guys uh, you know, caught that in terms of having uh, compute resources uh, deployed within your, the context of your application and have them actually uh, scale up or, or out, if you will, as your customer demand grows, goes up, and then they can essentially scale back in when your customer demand goes down. And so, in other words, there was, there was a cost factor here, but more importantly, we wanted to make sure at any time, if our application went really viral and we had to actually scale out and meet that customer demand, we were able to do so without impacting our, our user experience. And so that's one of our, our, our key decisions that we had to make. That's really where auto-scaling groups uh, came in play. So auto-scaling groups, with auto-scaling groups, you can essentially launch uh, one or more EC2 instances. And as these instances come online, they automatically uh, get registered with our elastic load balancing solution. The, the cool thing about auto-scaling groups for us was we could actually uh, monitor metrics such as average CPU utilization or network IO, if you will, or perhaps even our own custom metrics such as latency and, and use those as 
triggers, if you will, to essentially react to, as, as a customer demand goes up, you know, we essentially, are, let's say our average CPU utilization hit a certain threshold when, when that alarm uh, went off, essentially auto scaling groups would add more EC2 instances, bring them in rotation, register them automatically with the load balancer, and our application would continue uh, to function just fine. So um, the decision that we made um, with regards to load balancing and scaling here was we were going to use our ELB solution as well as auto scaling group for, for our web tier. So what you're actually seeing here is our first uh, architectural diagram uh, Peter Mark talked about metadata, so we decided for the likables, we were essentially going to store all that metadata in DynamoDB. Um, we were actually going to have images uh, that were uploaded directly into S3. So uh, the key decision there for us on the web tier really was we needed a solution that would handle the metadata piece. So as applications came, so essentially the static contents and dynamic content as well as, as, as upload abilities of, of, of our application. So if you think about this architecture diagram, what you're actually seeing is it's deployed across multiple availability zones within the context of a region. You essentially have an auto scaling group, have a load balancer sitting in front, and uh, the media essentially is directly uh, read from S3 as well as being generated directly into S3. So, as we start talking about scale, we had to think about the scale aspects of our application at multiple levels. So far, we've just really talked about databases. Peter Mark touched upon DynamoDB and S3. Uh, I, I talked briefly about load balancing and, and auto scaling. But we also needed to ensure that at, at a DNS level, we were able to, to meet those, those scalability needs. No complex requirements really from a DNS perspective. All we needed was, well, we basically have a site, www.likeability.me. It resolves to, you know, it can essentially resolve to uh, the ELB. And so that was pretty straightforward in terms of the requirements. However, we, we needed to ensure that we had uh, a highly available, highly scalable DNS solution because as millions of users would come to our site, the last thing we wanted to do uh, to deal with was, uh, you know, have, have DNS queries, uh, queries fail. So with regards to DNS, the decision that we made was we were essentially going to go with Amazon Route 53. Pretty straightforward. The SLA that Route 53 has is 100%. It's, it's always av available all the time. And in addition to that, it actually can scale and meet uh, your needs as the customer demand goes up. So coming back to our architecture diagram, as you can see, we've basically added a new component in the mix uh, to the far top right. Uh, it's essentially Route 53. And so we basically had a hosted zone called likeability.me. So Route 53 is not an icon registrar, so you'd have to go to uh, some registrar such as, as godaddy.com, if you will. But essentially point, once you have the domain uh, name registered to you, you would essentially just point uh, that domain to the name service that Route 53 provides, and that's essentially how, how you'd configure. So what, I, what I'm actually illustrating here is two subdomains uh, that we've created under um, the hosted zone, which is likeability.me. So there's a www domain, and then we essentially have an images uh, subdomain. And so what we're doing here is www points to the ELB, images essentially points to S3 directly. Next, let's actually talk about our content delivery network. So what, what is it that we were actually looking for here? Again, our the whole intent of our application was user behavior. I mean, we really wanted to ensure that the user experience of our, our application was great. And so we really needed uh, to, to, to make sure that the images that were actually being delivered either via mobile devices or on our website were actually loaded fairly quickly. Now, since these images are uploaded once, they don't actually change quite often. The content delivery network makes a lot of sense uh, for us. And so we could leverage the edge caching, if you will, um, of base, that, that is provided uh, with the global edge uh, network that uh, essentially a CDN provides. Again, no particularly unusual requirements as such with, uh, with a CDN. So the decision that we made with regards to our content delivery network was, was CloudFront. So again, pretty straightforward with CloudFront, what you would do is uh, you could we, we essentially created a download distribution. Uh, we basically fronted that download distribution and said the origin is our S3 bucket. And so 
Once that happened, uh, essentially, if a user is coming from California, they would essentially hit uh, a Northern California pop. If a, if a user is, is hitting our site from London, they would essentially hit a, a London pop. And then essentially the content, the images that are, that are cached in those edge locations would actually be delivered to them with really low latency because the, the, the uh, call is always not going back to the origin server. So from that perspective, as you can see, as we look at our architecture, we've added a new component in the mix. It's CloudFront, and you can see CloudFront sits right in front of S3. Um, so with regards to DNS, what we would have to do here was we basically just took images.likeability.me, and rather than pointing it to S3, we essentially pointed it to the CloudFront distribution. So let's look at our architecture decision four. OS web stack, what, what are we comfortable with? Amazon Linux, Apache and Ruby. That's basically what we decided to go with. Load balancing scaling. We basically said elastic load balancing works great for us in terms of, of the balancing abilities, but more importantly, scales with, as, as our customers uh, uh, would, as, as our customer uh, requests that would hit our application would grow. In terms of DNS, we basically said all we really needed was a highly available, highly reliable DNS solution, which was Route 53. Uh, with our content delivery network, we essentially uh, needed to ensure our user experience was really good. The performance of our application was great in terms of the images, and so we could essentially get low latency, uh, and, and the images would get delivered from the edge locations, and that's, that's essentially where we chose uh, CloudFront. So let's actually visit our tenants, if you will, against architecture decision four. In terms of scalability, we've talked about that quite a bit throughout uh, the web tier session. In term, you can essentially scale out as, as your demand grows up. In terms of availability, as you saw in the architecture diagram, we were leveraging multiple availability zones. And so the, the elastic load balancer is deployed within the context of multiple availability zones, as well as the EC2 instances that we were running were within multiple availability zones. So we were basically, um, we, were, we were dealing with node failures as well as AZ failures. And we would still have our application to be uh, highly available. From a performance perspective, we looked at several different things. Peter Mark talked about um, database performance in, in terms of how our data and, and what we could do. We also um, looked at, at content delivery network to actually improve our performance. So essentially from an architectural decision, CDNs as such helped us in, in terms of getting the right performance uh, for our application. In terms of security, HTTPS, there's a lot of, um, we could essentially have HTTPS enabled and a lot of the SSL termination offloading, if you will, of our web tier could easily be handled using the Elastic Load Balancer's um, SSL termination uh, technique. So we were essentially able to get, uh, get that going. So does it meet our tenants? Yes. Next, what I'd like to actually talk about is the application tier of likability. So what do we really, really mean when we say an application tier? Because we've really talked about data store choices, and we've talked about a, a, a pretty straightforward web application, if you will. But what we really, really wanted to do was, when an image actually got uploaded, we wanted to uh, handle a few back-end tasks uh, for performance reasons. So one of the things was, let's say a, a user takes an image, or they upload it from, from their uh, Mac or PC, uh, it's, it's a large size image, and, and so that image is essentially getting stored in S3. However, we were looking at our application, and again, keeping back, uh, going back to uh, the, the conversation around customer experience, we wanted to have better customer experience. What we'd like to do was resize those images uh, so that they could actually work well with mobile devices and we weren't necessarily downloading the entire two meg or five meg or a 12 meg image, if you will. And so we needed a, a backend workflow task manager that could actually handle some of those, those backend tasks. In addition to that, since our application was focused on, you know, on essentially social media styled application where you have likes and, and images and tags and titles and what have you, uh, we, we basically needed a, a framework that could help us run some analytics. So uh, as an example, we basically, you know, since it's November and we're all doing the November thing uh, in, in the New York and, and, and Herndon offices, we could essentially, we, we wanted to run say ad hoc queries against uh, our DynamoDB table uh, to, to essentially see, well, what's, uh, how many likes actually has the tag Movember got in the last week? 
or how many images were uploaded as such, or which region or who uploaded them. And so we needed to run some ad hoc analysis um, on, on some of the data that we were, uh, we were gathering. So we needed something on our application tier on the back end that could actually do some of this uh, crunching, if you will, uh, for, for BI purposes. So the decisions that we had to make in uh, our, our application tier was, well, how are we going to manage these back-end tasks? We need a reliable uh, a framework of sorts that would actually manage these back-end tasks for us. How are we going to process these images, if you will? And then in addition to that, we basically needed a, a framework to perform analytics. So with regards to the back-end tasks, um, we needed to ensure that our back-end um, workflow framework could actually scale. Again, it was all about going from a few hundred images to potentially millions of images. And so we needed a, a, a workflow solution could, that could actually keep up uh, with scaling. One of the design tenets that we uh, employed here was we, we decided that we were essentially going to decouple our web tier from our application tier. Once an image is uploaded, it goes directly to S3. The data is stored in DynamoDB. And then essentially our web tier would hand off uh, decoupled, I mean, essentially asynchronously hand off uh, the workload to our quote-unquote back-end uh, workflow manager. So with regards to the workflow manager, we decided that we were going to use simple workflow service. And again, the key aspect here was simple workflow service is a, a highly available, highly distributed workflow service, maintains workflow states, and the key there is it's fully managed. So we didn't have to deal with the actual management aspects of, of uh, the actual uh, workflow service. So as you can see here, what you're actually seeing now is we, we have an autoscale group, um, which now is really meant for the image processing where the resizing activities happen. So if you, if you think in terms of user experience, a user uploads an image, goes to the web tier, metadata is stored, the, data is, the images are actually stored in S3, and the handoff goes to simple workflow. There's a decider node, if else logic there, and then there's a whole bunch of worker nodes that would actually perform the tasks of resizing, creating thumbnail versions, creating mobile versions, and, and what have you, and store the data back into S3. So architecture decision five, we, were just, we basically decided we were going to use simple workflow. Does it satisfy our tenants? Yes, it does. It can scale uh, really well. Essentially, from an availability perspective, it's, uh, we, we, we were employing our, our task nodes across multiple availability zones within the context of an auto-scaling group. So as, we, as the work went up, we could add more task nodes to, to employ the resizing activities. Uh, performance perspective, really, really fast. We'll demonstrate that to you uh, in, in a few minutes here. As, and from a security perspective, essentially, uh, we were using uh, secure methods from our web tier to actually talk uh, to, to the simple workflow to essentially go ahead and, and, and kick off a workflow task. Uh, we were using we're, uh, uh, Amazon's identity and access management, where uh, there are access IDs and, and secret keys that can be used uh, to essentially kick off uh, certain workflow tasks. So architecture decision five meets our tenets in terms of our, our, our backend uh, workflow manager. Next, we're actually going to look at analytics. So with regards to analytics, popularity of images, trends, uh, ad hoc variabilities, scheduled reports. These are the kind of activities that we were thinking of as we were collecting large amounts of data. We wanted to make uh, these interesting results available back to our end users, as well as run some of those results, just run some of those, those queries um, on, on our end just to see how, how our application was, was performing. So really what we needed uh, was a highly parallelized framework, uh, a MapReduce framework, if you will, that would actually help us run through some of these, these an analytics. Again, we're not good necessarily at, at managing uh, the infrastructure and, and, and dealing with the clustering aspects of, of a MapReduce um, style framework. In fact, we didn't really want to even get down to the lower level MapReduce, write mappers and reducers. All we needed to do was a simple SQL style query, uh, query interface uh, that didn't require any sort of interactivity. So we could basically say, um, run a, a query that, that shows me the trends of Movember, if you will. And Hive actually does, does that really well when it sits on top of, of MapReduce. So what Elastic MapReduce does for us is gives us the ability to, uh, it's, it's essentially a managed Hadoop framework, it integrates well with, with Hive and, and MapReduce, and it actually scales. So you, you, could, you can essentially say, 
I, I basically want uh, additional nodes in the mix because I want this query to run faster. And so you could make an API call. More nodes get added in rotation. Uh, the, the master node essentially submits the MapReduce tasks uh, over to those, those additional nodes that come in rotation. And so from a scalability perspective, we were actually able to achieve uh, the, the analytics, if you will. Uh, and, and we could perform those analytics faster. So as you can see, we have a new component in the mix. Um, it's Elastic MapReduce that sits right on top of DynamoDB. It's essentially reading the metadata and storing it back in DynamoDB. Decision, architecture decision six for analytics on our application tier, we're actually going to use EMR. Does it satisfy our architecture tenants? Yes, it does. So Paul talked about this in terms of mobile experience. When we started thinking about mobile experience, we really needed to think about how, how are we actually going to have these images uploaded, uploaded directly into, into S3? What are the security concerns around doing so, right? And so we really needed a, a secure manner in which we could actually have keys, access ID secret keys, um, available to the device, the mobile devices, that could then, those keys then could be used to actually upload um, the data directly into S3. So the main decision we needed to make was experience was simple, uh, and we wanted the, the user uh, behavior for mobile devices to be uh, fairly seamless. As I mentioned, the challenge here was secure uploads. How are we going to get these access ID secret keys over to the mobile devices? The last thing we wanted to do was have hard-coded keys sitting in our mobile application and essentially an Android or an iOS app with, with hard-coded keys, which are, give, gives uh, users access directly to S3. So we basically thought of this concept called token vending machine. And essentially, token vending machine is a way for us to provide temporary credentials to our mobile users. So Amazon's identity and access management service has a, a, it has a, a, a feature called secure token service where you can go to the identity and access management service and say, okay, I'm a valid, authenticated, authorized user. Give me a set of, of keys, uh, that, and the expiry around these keys is anywhere between an hour and 36 hours. So essentially temporary tokens, if you will. So token vending machine was a way for us to actually issue temporary tokens to our mobile devices, and uh, those essentially would be session-based tokens, if you will. Someone would come in, authenticate to the token vending machine, get a token, perform the upload to S3, and done. So the bigger challenge for us in terms of the token vending machine was, well, okay, so how are we gonna run this, right? So in, in terms of the decision there, we actually decided that we were going to use a, a service called Elastic Beanstalk. Again, undifferentiated heavy lifting of actually setting all this up. Rather than going through the process of setting up a load balancer, an auto-scaling group, have it scale, we basically decided, well, we're just going to use Beanstalk. We, we would provide Beanstalk uh, a, a Java app or, or a Ruby app, and Beanstalk would essentially provision all the necessary resources required for us, such as a load balancer, such as an auto-scaling group. It would essentially spin up nodes. It would manage the policies for us, and so on and so forth. So you might question, well, why didn't we choose um, Beanstalk uh, for our web tier? Well, what we were trying to do with, in, in terms of this session was we wanted to give both options out there. And so in this instance, we could, we could have easily done that with Beanstalk. But when we, when we started our application with a web tier, we basically said we're, we're basically needed, uh, we, we started off with, with a smaller uh, deployment model, if you will. And so we, we essentially decided that uh, for our web tier, we were going to do this ourselves. But with, uh, with regards to the token vending machine, we were essentially going to use Beanstalk. So as you can see on the architecture diagram, we now have Beanstalk out there. Uh, the mobile device talks to the token vending machine to get a, a token, a temporary credential, and essentially now has the ability to upload objects in a more secure manner directly into S3. Architecture decision seven, token vending, vending machine for mobile security. Elastic Beanstalk was going to be the, the solution that we were going to use to host it. Does it meet our needs? Yes, it's essentially very, very similar to what you saw with the web tier. Essentially scales, has a load balancer in front, can scale, has auto scaling groups. You can essentially set policies that to scale out and scale in. And so token vending machine was actually, uh, would, would, would satisfy when it's deployed within the context of Beanstalk, these tenants that we had defined. So with that, I hand it back over to Paul. Thanks, now we're slightly, um, with 
28 seconds away from the end of the session. So quick poll, because I know I'm between you in the bar or the tables. Who'd like to see a very, very quick demo? The demo wins. So let's see if this is going to um, work, like dealing with small children, animals. And Umesh, I need you to come back, because you're going to be our male model for this kind of thing. So we can see this mobile device here. The contrast is slightly bad, but we see the same kind of things with all of these people. I could have another embarrassing look at uh, my lack of, um, lack of kind of mo for November, but I'm, I'm going to like it because I've only got one like so far, so let's make that a little bit better for my ego. So as well as seeing all of these things, which are shown in the right resolution because of the workflow stuff we talked about before, what we can also do is share something. So we're going to take a picture now. I'm going to take this picture of Umesh. So we can see it on the screen. Yep, I like that. I think I like it. And then we get to give it a title. So we'll call it um, Umesh. Tags, well, moustache is one. Does anybody here have a used car? Would they have bought it from Umesh? I think they might have done. So we'll put used car and salesman. And hit OK. And if the wireless network in the room is going to work, uh, what we can see, if we look at our recent likables, we should see Umesh in all his glory. So since we started doing that upload, that back-end workflow task took off and started to do the kind of the resizing. And also, the other stuff, we got a temporary security credential from the token vending machine so that this device could talk to and upload this file to S3 in a secure way. So really, really simple from the point of view of the developer, an offload so that this is just sending it straight up into S3, and then that task gets kicked off. So back to the slides as we finish off. I'm, thank you very much, Umesh, for your model. I'm not going to recap the kind of architecture, because that's what Umesh is just taking you through point by point. So we dissected the application. Hopefully, this was useful. We tried to take you through all of the decisions at the different tiers of the application. And this, this presentation is keen to get to the end as well. Uh, we took that journey from an idea to implementation. We tried to take a, a dissection view of each of those tiers, explain some of the decisions, how you can use AWS building blocks, gave you an introduction to some of them, and hopefully stimulated you to go and explore them. Please give us some feedback. This was an experimental session. We'd love to know how we could improve it. We'd love to know what you thought of the conference. It was our first one. We'll be around here if you have questions. We'll also be at the bar. Hope you enjoyed the conference. Thanks very much, and have a great rest of your trip here. Thank you.